Good evening, everybody. This is Bob Mater with the uh, National Association of Flight Instructors. I'm very glad to have everybody here. Well, we've got a great attendance, uh, and it's, I'm sure it's because not because of me, but because of our uh, great guest that we have on tonight, uh, Rod Machado, who uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing. Well, I, don't know, I think we bumped into each other the first time at Oshkosh 18, 19 years ago, I think, Rod. So, Bob, I think that's, uh, that's probably the case. Yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure uh, being here with you and uh, the gang here that I'm looking at. Uh, looks like we have a, a few people there, and uh, I get to talk about flight instruction, and that's, uh, that's always a good thing. That's exciting. That's exciting to us. Uh, just a moment here, uh, just a quick, couple of quick ground rules. Uh, so everybody knows I have you, everybody on mute at the moment. Uh, that way we don't get a lot of crosstalk and, uh, and echo. What I'd like, to, what I'm going to do is open up the mics, but I'm going to ask everybody, everybody to be on their honor. <coughs> if you have a mute button on your computer or on your phone, please use it so we don't get echo, so we don't get uh, background noise and so on. And otherwise, uh, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to mute you if there's uh, too much noise. So, uh, with that, Rod, uh, as I said, I've known you for quite a while. Uh, I'm going to give you some credit for something. If it weren't for Rod. I probably wouldn't be a flight instructor. He and several other of the uh, greats in the uh, in the industry inspired me, and uh, you get the blame, or at least not you and several well, other good. people. That's great, Bob. I'm happy to take that blame, and uh, I uh, I feel um, honored that I may have played some small part in um, helping or assisting or uh, offering whatever little advice I could in uh, your flight instructor activity. So uh, and it's quite clear that you are. Uh, uh, you are really enjoying flight instruction. So what would you like to, what would you like to talk about? Uh, Sorry about that. Rod, excuse me, one moment. Okay. Rod, I apologize. I had to mute everybody because there's one wide open mic out there. Oh, Sorry that's about. fine. That's okay, please, please, please. I interrupted you there uh, with that. I apologize. No, I, I said, uh, what would you like to talk about? There are many different uh, subjects and uh, things that are of interest to me. And um, did you have anything in particular you'd like to start off with? Well, NAPI is all about excellence in flight instruction. Um, we're getting away from, although professionalism is important, professionalism is a bit vague. So we're really pushing the term excellence. And we want all of our members to strive to that and help each other be, uh, be excellent. So why don't, why don't we start there? And if people want to chime in, what I'll do is ask uh, folks to use the chat room tonight because we have a large crowd. And uh, I'll pass on the questions. OK. Um, well, so be it. Let, uh, let me make a few observations about, uh, about flight instruction and ec excellence in flight instruction. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the most important things, I, I believe, in aviation is to uh, provide a quality training uh, for people that are interested in becoming either, uh, let's say, a recreational pilot, uh, a private pilot who flies for fun, uh, a sport pilot, or somebody that wants to uh, fly for a living. And um, the, uh, uh, the, the probably one of the, the most important things for most people is money. It costs a lot of money to take flight training. Flight training is becoming even more expensive, uh, uh, has become more expensive over the years. And now it, uh, if you go to some of the Cessna pilot centers, as an example, very well-known, very uh, capable uh, uh, and, and quality flight training centers, um, I think uh, several years ago they were saying the uh, private pilot certificate would cost $12,500, and that's based on 55 hours of training. And I think it's up to about 14000 now because of the increase in fuel prices. Well, the question is, you know, how is the average person going to um, find, uh, well, I unless they have college funding or they have mommies and daddies that will pay for this, how are they going to find the money to take flight training? And uh, this, is a, this is a very, very important question. Uh, we can be pricing people right out of the market. Well, um, that's a, a question that uh, I, I think about constantly. And when we talk about excellent in, excellence in flight instruction as, uh, as the, uh, the, the topic of the day here, um, excellence in flight instruction means, uh, all, means partly finding a way to make flight instruction um, as inexpensive for people as possible. And there are several ways to do that. One of the ways that's being used now by 
by several people, um, from people out here at the Community College Center to the people at the Redbird Flight Training Facility, um, to the individuals at uh, MN Aviation, Mike Nevins Aviation in Albert Lee, Minnesota, which offers uh, it's an accelerated flight training school. And it's one of my absolute most favorite accelerate, accelerated flight training uh, schools. And uh, what they do is this. Well, um, what, what the majority of people are doing right now is using um, flight simulators with uh, their flight training. And this could be a desktop simulator using Microsoft Flight Simulator as an example, or the uh, sexy big Redbird full motion simulator. Um, but it doesn't have to be, again, a big sexy simulator. It can be a regular desktop simulator. Um, good training materials. Good, a good simulator with which to reinforce basic skills and a flight instructor that uses a syllabus that is not, uh, let's say, the airline type uh, syllabus or the type of syllabus that is uh, so bulked up that it's, it's almost impossible to, treat peop uh, to train people in, let's say, the shortest, most reasonable amount of time. And thus, I've been a big advocate of the minimalist syllabus, which I have posted on my website that uh, was originally conception of the FAA back in 1971. And uh, they offered a minimalist syllabus in the back of their flight instructor manual, the 1971 version of the FAA's flight instruction manual. So uh, I would recommend people take a look at that. And the philosophy of training is training people based on your uh, basic stick and rudder skills, teaching them to fly, not teaching them to be, uh, let's say, airline pilots. And so with that, uh, the individuals that do that uh, tend to produce products that are quality products and uh, uh, reasonably inexpensive products, uh, such as a student can go to MN Aviation in Albert Lee, Minnesota, and get a private license ab initio in 21 days, uh, learning basic good stick and rudder skills, and pay, the last time I heard, $8,400 for, uh, for that license. Uh, now, that's affordable. Uh, $14,500 or so may not be affordable. And to keep in mind that that is the, uh, the, uh, the, what Cessna says at the Cessna Pilot Center uh, for, um, let's say, uh, 55 hours of flight training. And we know that many people take a little bit longer. So, you know, again, that's kind of where I'm at. And not, not to say that Cessna Pilot Centers don't do a great job. They certainly do. It's just that sometimes uh, certain places... Um, um, it, it's just more expensive to take flight training in certain places. And uh, the, the fact that uh, flight training can cost around $14,000, $15,000, that's, that's a lot of money for most people. Yeah, it is a lot of money. Uh, is it your impression, you've been instructing since, I should know this, 73, uh, I think? Yes, 1973. In real dollars. Has, has learning to fly gone up, down, sideways, stayed the same? No, it's gone, it's gone up, and here's the reason why. There are several reasons. One, insurance is one, uh, and fuel. Fuel costs a lot more. So, no, there's, there's no comparison between learning to fly now and learning to fly um, 20, 30, or 40 years ago. It, uh, it's, um, it, th those two things themselves make it far, far more expensive. Consider this. The average person can go into a, um, a, a flight school, uh, you know, just pick any large flight school, and uh, the uh, individual can pay, uh, let's say, $170 an hour for a Cessna 172, maybe $50 an hour for a, uh, an instructor, but it's typically much higher than that. And you're walking out with one hour, one uh, two-hour block of lesson and one hour in the airplane, um, somewhere around close to $300, 1.1 hours or something like that. So that's a that's a, a chunk of money. In many cases, it's a little bit more. And of course, big flight schools have to charge more for their product. And you know what? I don't have any problem with that at all. Uh, it, that's just the way it is uh, for many schools that have a, a high overhead. The real issue is the type of training that's offered because a good flight instructor, uh, let's say a, uh, a, a professional instructor with the student's interest at heart, will find a way to train that student. Uh, in other words, uh, find a way to uh, train the students so that that student can acquire the necessary skills to fly safely, and that's key. 
but do it in a shorter period of time. And that, uh, that's extremely important. Thus, the reason using simulators tends to be extremely important when it comes to uh, offering flight training for individuals because you can build some very good behavioral skills using simulators um, that the student can learn something in the airplane, go home and practice in the simulator. And uh, that is a very valuable thing to do. That minimizes the cost of flight training. In addition to the fact that there are many things in airplanes that instructors teach that you know really are best left to being taught on the ground where uh, the air cost of the airplane is not involved. And in many cases, the instructor doesn't have to be involved because the things like um, well, a lot of aviation decision making and judgment, not all, but a lot can be taught on the ground uh, using some good videos, uh, good books, good audio programs. There, there are a lot of things out there like that. So um, those, things are, those things are very, very valuable to consider to minimize the cost of flight training. And like I say, it doesn't matter. I don't want to give anybody the impression that big flight centers aren't the places to go to get the training that you want. Um, you know, that's, I'm, I'm happy that we have those flight centers. But uh, I'm, I'm also hoping that flight instructors in those centers will do their best to uh, provide the uh, training in such a way that it minimizes the expense incurred by the student during the training process. And I'll give you a good example of that. A friend of mine, Ed Valdez, it, teaches at Cypress College, uh, uses simulators, uh, and I should say that's, uh, that's, I believe that's Cerritos College, excuse me, uses flight simulators. And I just received a message from him. He uh, just sent his first student up uh, with this simulator program that he has at uh, Cerritos. The student has 39 hours of flight time and is ready for his private pilot certificate. And that's in Southern California. And so Ed is doing something absolutely right uh, when it comes to uh, uh, training students. And keep in mind that uh, the FBOs out here uh, at Edwards County Airport are not inexpensive. They charge, a, just like the Cessna Pilot Center, they charge a fair price for their airplanes and instructors because they have overhead to maintain and high quality maintenance and what have you. So um, a private license can be acquired in a short period of time if the tools of uh, you know, good ground training materials, good simulator uh, put to good use, and a flight instructor willing to do that, uh, all those things in play can make a, uh, provide a uh, you know, reasonable uh, uh, chance for a student pilot to acquire a license uh, with minimum expense. Okay, and a follow-up to that, Paul, I don't have his last name, Ask how do you convince students that a cons that concentrated learning is cheaper in the long run? Uh, that is, I call it uh, well the accelerated training. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you convince them it's cheaper in the long run? And I'll follow up uh, with a question of my own: is when you're interviewing flight students or flight excuse me flight instructors or an FBO, mm -hmm. how does the aviation the new aviation consumer how do they know they're finding excellence? Well, um, that's, a, that's a. I mean, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things I've I've always believed um, that uh, would be the cure for any of the the ills in the flight instruction business would be to excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. I should take up smoking. I already have the cough. <clears throat> Apologize for that. Uh, would be to educate the consumer. You see, we talk about how to train flight instructors and uh, how to um, uh, uh, raise the bar for flight instructors to uh, make flat, uh, allow flight instructors to do better. And that's an important thing. And uh, the FA has done that over the years with the, uh, the flight instructor revalidation clinics. Uh, that has certainly raised the bar for flight instructors. And you can see a measurable uh, reduction in aviation accidents, uh, accidents and fatalities when that program started back in the 1960s. Uh, it's a, it, it, in fact, it was it and the aviation safety seminars were primarily responsible for that uh, dramatic drop in aviation fatalities and aviation accidents uh, from the 1960s to the uh, early 1980s. But getting back to the question, uh, by educating the consumer, you also allow the uh, quality of the flight instructor to be um, increased. And so how do you go about educating this consumer? The, uh, well, AOPA has done that um, with their, their wonderful um, information packets that they were providing uh, anybody that um, uh, w w was interested in 
uh, collecting information on flight training. The AOPA would provide them with that information. Uh, the FA has really not done, to my knowledge, any promotion um, that would uh, help educate the uh, aviation consumer, the student pilot. Uh, wow. They've got some material, but not like what AOPA has provided. And if the FA were to provide more, because most people would, uh, my guess is, probably go to the um, uh, FAA source uh, as a, a means of looking for guidance on how to pick a good flight instructor, or how to know what a good flight school is. Sometimes that's hard to do politically, but um, educating the consumer tends to be a, a very important thing. As an example, on my website, I have an article called How to Pick a Good Flight Instructor. And I list uh, something like around 13 different things that one should look at to identify how to, uh, how a, what a good flight instructor uh, would do, uh, how he or she would do it, and uh, then you know how to dance with a good flight instructor, so to speak, how to how to know if you're, uh, you're if you're getting along with the person, uh, how to uh, deal with discrepancies and things like that. So um, educating the consumer tends to be extremely important, uh, and we don't do enough of that. Okay. Well, and then I guess. Um, my question would be if somebody comes in, um, they're, they walk into the FBO or the school and they've never seen any of this stuff. They're complete newbies. They do, all they know is they want to go fly an airplane. Mm -hmm. What can we do as CFIs, as instructors, as flight training providers to help them know that we're good? Now, in, Without a high-pressure sales technique, I guess is where I'm going with that. Well, one of the um, – uh, um, first of all, there, there are two questions here that uh, are, I see on my screen. I'll get back to those in a second from Jeffrey Gilbert. Um, but to answer your question, Bob, I, I think that um, one of the things that uh, flight instructors have to do is they have to be obviously good salespeople. And um, uh, as with most people that sell things, uh, you have people that have used your products. So uh, what you would do is you would reference – uh, you would provide a reference for for your students, uh, for any new students, with your um, your your uh, current students or past students, so that they can, uh, your the, the uh, a new prospect might be uh, able to contact these individuals. And there's just nothing that works better than referrals, or I should say, word of mouth, and referrals as a way of doing that. And those things are those things are very very important. I I think that uh, um, it, with uh, the, the the idea of uh, first of all a student showing up looking for a flight instructor, uh, if you you know if you make the experience a, a pleasant one, and uh, what I do whenever I get in an airplane with a brand new student or somebody that is interested in taking flight training, I realize uh, their big concern is that even though they might they might not express this, one of their big concerns is how safe they are and psychologically, uh, do they have a sense of control. And a person's going to get in an airplane with you. They tend, I mean, obviously they're going to trust you to some degree. But I, I give them what I call my um, you can trust me speech. And uh, what I basically say in the speech is that it, it, before we, we take off and fly, I, I say that there's nothing that uh, they can do in the airplane that is going to hurt me or the airplane because the best have tried. And I'm not going to let them do anything that's going to hurt the airplane or me. And I'm going to give them uh, the power of what I call veto, and, uh, which is not uh, something I learned from an Italian flight instructor friend of mine. Uh, the power of veto is that at any moment, they, if they say that they want to get back on the ground, uh, I will get them back on the ground in the shortest possible time. So that, that that gives them some sense of control. Because remember, they're in an airplane, and they are there uh, with the uh, nascent fears that all individuals have, the in instinctual fears that we have, and that is a fear of loud noises and a fear of falling. Well, it's the fear of falling that concerns them in this case. And, of course, I have a fear of making loud noises while falling, but it's the fear <laughs> of falling in an airplane. And so uh, I, I recognize that. And so when somebody takes a flying lesson with me, I make the experience such that uh, I leave them wanting more. Uh, I let them achieve some form of success. And as a result, they, uh, uh, they have a, a good experience. And, and most important, uh, I make sure that they walk away on that very first flight. 
by having uh, at, by, by with learning something. They have to be able to, in my opinion, acquire some distinct behavioral change. And even if it's learning to make a turn, uh, if, if a climb, descent, or, or combination of those things, it doesn't matter. If they can do that, that represents success to them. And uh, so I give them a, a, some something they can take home with them, a sense of behavioral change. And uh, that is, a, uh, to me, a very, very good thing to do. And Bob, by the way, I do see a couple of questions here. Um, yeah. Here, the uh, one, Jim Hamilton, uh, so I'm sorry, uh, Jeffrey uh, Gerbert asked, um, too many students and not enough flight instructors, and the owner wants private students to be done in three to four weeks. Um, I'm not sure what uh, Jeff is asking here, but it seems to me that um, private students Three to four weeks, well, again, uh, accelerated tri flight training, the way it's done at MN Aviation, and I'm, I'm a big fan of that flight school in Albert Lee, Minnesota. They have an ab initio, ab initio 21 day program, three week program. It can be done in that program, but the, the thing is, all of those flight instructors there work from a very uh, um, uh, strict and um, standardized curriculum so that each flight instructor knows what the other flight instructor is doing. And uh, they um, are all um, focused on teaching the student how to fly, not how to fly like an airline pilot, how to fly like a private pilot. And therefore, all the techniques are stick and rudder based, practical, um, and they work. And that's how they have a 98% success rate at MN Aviation in Albert Lee, Minnesota. 98% success rate. I, it just... It's amazing, uh, but it can be done, and, and there are several other flight schools that do the same thing. And Bob, yeah. hold on for a second. Um, let's see. Uh, we have – there are also um, – there are many other – well, one question I get from many instructors is this, Bob, and that is a student that has uh, taken accelerated flight training, let's say accelerated instrument training, the 10-day program, and um, the, the question about those, what kind of students are these? You know, by and large, every student I've ever flown with that is trained in an accelerated program has done fine. Uh, they're, they're, they're competent, they're capable. The single most important thing anybody has to do after they take an accelerated flight training program uh, for instrument training is to get out and fly instruments right after they get their instrument rating. Because uh, the uh, rate of decay in one's confidence, not one's skill, but in one's confidence, uh, decrease is, is quite high. In other words, one would lose confidence quickly after accelerated training in instruments for the IF instrument rating if they didn't get out and do a lot of flight training uh, after that, immediately after that, I'm sorry, if they didn't get out, and get out and do a lot of instrument flying immediately after that. So that's the only mitigating factor there with that. There's another question here. Is the FAA going to allow more credit for simulator time toward the private pilot license? This seems to be a challenge in justifying more, more use of the simulator. My response is it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care what the FAA is going to do. Uh, if, if the FAA didn't allow any simulator flight time whatsoever credit for private pilot license as they do in part 141 schools it is completely irrelevant uh, what is relevant is getting the student trained so that they can get their private pilot license in the shortest period of time it's unlikely they're going to get a private pilot certificate in less than 40 hours um, considering all the things you have to train them to do so um, it, that that is the at least the the minimalist goal uh, that we should have for a private pilot certificate, and and I, I say that tongue in cheek because I, I know that uh, that that's that is hard to do. But the point is, using a simulator uh, can help, as it just is demonstrated by my friend Ed Valdez at Cerritos College. Um, using a simulator can help minimize the flight time requirement, irrespective of the fact that the FA will or will not allow a simulator flight time for the private pilot certificate. I agree with that. We, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have access to a Redbird here in Omaha, and uh, I've taken students as an experiment. I took somebody up VFR, simulated VFR, did uh, rectangular courses with them, then a couple of times in the box, and then took them out uh, in an airplane, and they got it on the first try. And yes. Whether or not that time counts, it was value added time. It was a value added uh, time for the student. 
Oh, exactly, Bob. Exactly. In fact, it's it, value-added time for the student, but uh, it's also value-added time for the flight instructor. A good example, I, I take a student out, I, I introduce him to flying, a bit, first hour of flying in the airplane. The student has been using Microsoft Flight Simulator, and um, he's also been using the lessons. By the way, I did the lessons in the Microsoft Flight Simulator 2004, uh, 2008, and uh, 2000 uh, and Microsoft X. So that's, I, I designed those lessons. I voiced them. I narrated them. And I did it as exactly as I would do it in an airplane uh, with respect to the fact that this is a simulator and there's certain things you can't do in a simulator, obviously. But anyway, the student shows up. He's taken those lessons before. He gets in the airplane and I sense this, this person has a good sense of how the airplane already works. And he wants to do a lot, so I would let him do as, as much as I can, of course, without uh, allowing either of us to be, uh, you know, to, to, to go beyond his particular limits where I have to take over the airplane. But uh, the, the point is there that um, I would then, uh, on the next lesson, say, listen, this is what I, what I want you to do. I want you to go practice the straight and level flight lesson. And that's what, and, and climbs, turns, and descents lessons in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Come on back, and that's what we're going to work on next. Read this chapter in this book. Read that chapter and listen to this or watch that video. The student comes back, and then it makes my job so much easier and certainly so much more fun because I see this rapid acceleration in their development because of the tools that were available uh, that uh, I used that allowed that student to do well. That is the key. It helps the flight instructor, and that is a good deal. Exactly. We've got a question here from David Cole. Um, he asked me to ask you your opinion of a college program that would have somebody complete their private, do apparently the entire syllabus, in a simulator of some sort, and then go out to the airplane. Would you mix and match, or would you do it all at once? Well, my, my preference is, listen, you can do some amazing things in simulators. There's, there's no doubt about that. But my preference mm -hmm. is this. In, in order to be able to um, uh, make use of the simulated experience you're having, I think it's important to have a little bit of flight time um, prior to actually using a simulator uh, for actual flight training. Because it's, it's possible that... Um, as an example, you go up and you work on some basic turns, so you have an idea what coordination feels like, and you, you have a sense of the, the motion of the airplane, the acceleration, deceleration, the pitch attitude. And then you get in a simulator, and that makes the experience more realistic. Because remember, the simulator simulates. It doesn't replicate. It's not a 100% replication platform. It simulates it. So the act, act of having some experience then makes the uh, simulator event more meaningful. So I like to mix and match. Although I, you know, um, listen, you can do some am amazing things in a, in a simulator. You can, um, I, I believe it is possible probably to train somebody to fly just using a simulator uh, without having uh, any experience at all on the airplane. But that's not my, that's not my reference. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a real funny story. There was a fellow in the 1970s named Buddy Foote F-O-O-T-E. And he was a glider pilot, and he was also an instructor at El Toro teaching in the, uh, I think it was the A-4, oh, teaching in the Sky Raider, some version of the Sky Raider. And um, he, he uh, decided one evening, he had no experience other than in the glider, uh, decided, uh, no flight experience other than in the glider, but decided one evening he was going to take um, a Sky Raider for a ride. So he hops in this jet, flies it around for an hour, comes back and lands. And, of course, the general is not too happy with him. Uh, but the fact is he had only flown the jet simulator, had never flown the actual jet, and was able to safely fly a jet mm -hmm. around. And uh, wow. you can find this on the Internet. It's kind of an interesting story to read. But, uh, again, the point was he, he had never flown a jet before. And uh, he was in this jet. Because he had the simulator experience, he made it work. Simulators can be used in such a way as to uh, rapidly accelerate the acquisition of flight training experience. So it's a, it's a really good thing, and I'm a big fan, but a big fan in the way that I just mentioned. Wow, that's, uh, that's great. And again, in my own experience, uh, I'm just starting that, uh, that type of training, and, and my experience is validated, uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'll give you uh, another example of how you can use a simulator. I wrote an article for Flight Training Magazine a while back called 
Suburi training, S-U-B-U-R-I. Suburi is a Japanese word uh, meaning um, a, a, a small exercise. In other words, an exercise kind of like a martial arts kata, but it's not a full length um, expression of many different martial arts moves. It's just a series of one or two small moves in order to uh, develop um, the, the basic habit pattern you need to have reflexive behavior in the cockpit. Simulators are perfect for this. And I'll give you the single most important, in my opinion, uh, uh, simulator uh, tool you can use in order to help somebody land an airplane. You put them two, uh, a mile out on final. You put the winds to, uh, or, oh, let's say, a uh, uh, gust, mm -hmm. um, maybe winds blowing 10 to 20 knots in gust. Uh, blow them straight down the runway, that's fine, but I want gust. And then you uh, put the student on final approach at the approach speed, a mile out, and you have the student work the rudders and ailerons just to keep the wings level, the nose aligned with the runway, and the airplane pitched down to maintain the desired airspeed. So uh, rudders to keep the nose straight, wings to keep, uh, ailerons to keep the wings level, and elevators to keep the nose pitched to the proper attitude for the airspeed you want, and this is all done power off, and you, thus you put the airplane, let's say, uh, oh, uh, at a mile out, maybe you'd put it up uh, at about uh, 800 feet or so, uh, or 600 feet. And just have the student practice keeping the wings level in those uh, gusty conditions without the nose yawing right and left. Thus, the student has to use rudder with the uh, aileron application. That helps keep the sight picture steady for the student. This can be done in a simulator. And when the student gets in an airplane, having had and acquired that basic pattern, habit pattern of um, keeping the wings level, no straight, and aircraft pitched properly, man, you've got something. That's a powerful tool. Suburi training, as it's called. Well, it's, that's a Japanese call it, but I, I use that term for that type of mini training, mini behavioral training that's done in simulators that really makes flight instructors' job easier. Okay. Okay. I'd like to. We can talk all night about simulators, and I'm probably going to talk into coming back because it's a great subject. But I'd like to go on to some other uh, some other things. Uh, in your experience, uh, talking around the country, uh, seeing other uh, meeting with other instructors and so on, if there's anything that you would like to fix? And I know I'm asking a loaded question, but if there's anything you, you, you could fix it in terms of reaching out to flight instructors, what would it be? Well, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Bob. <laughs> there's so many, <laughs> so many things. You know, flight instructors do, a, do a, 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 I think, a great job. They, they do a fine job. They, uh, you know, they, I, they're, they're, let me, let me just, let me, let me put it this way. I, I would leave the flight instructor alone to teach the student. Uh, I, I wouldn't place too many demands on the flight instructor. Uh, I would give them a good syllabus, the right tools, and then I would, uh, um, you know, I, I just let them do the job that I, th I think that they're, they're qualified to do and that they're trained to do. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the other thing that perhaps if there's one thing, I don't know if it's fix is the proper word, but there's one thing that I think all good flight instructors need. Um, there was a wonderful book written many years ago uh, that was titled, um, uh, oh gosh, it's, in fact, it's such a great book, I actually forgot the title. Um, it's called, I think it was called What the Masters Know. Oh, no, 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 excuse me, that's another book. It's called Zen in the Martial Arts. Zen in the Martial Arts. It was a great book. And the, the book consisted of an interview uh, with Bong Su Han, famous Hapkido master. Uh, he was the guy who taught Billy Jack his moves for the movie Billy Jack. Uh, Tom Laughlin played Billy Jack, of course. And anyway, they asked Bong Su Han, at this time he was 65 years old and uh, a master, Hapkido master, uh, if he still took training from someone else. And Bong Su Han said, yes, even the masters have masters. And he referenced uh, Bruce Lee as having a master. Uh, Yip Man. Yip Man was Bruce Lee's master. And I find it interesting that the, some of the best flight instructors I've ever met still have, let's say, masters. It's somewhat in the martial arts sense, but they have people that they look up to, they can, they can talk to, uh, they can seek guidance from. 
because um, it, it, sometimes it's hard to be able to solve every single problem on your own, and it's so valuable to respect, reflect with someone who has uh, more wisdom, uh, more insight by virtue of having more experience than you. And every person should have a master in this case. And I'll give you a good example of that. You know, when I first started flight instructing, um, Ralph Butcher was the gentleman who was uh, at Orange County Airport. And I tell you, I, I remember back in the 1970s going up and you know, pulling on his coattails, asking him questions that um, I, I didn't know the answer to. And, you know, Ralph is, a, Ralph is a very wise man, very capable, highly experienced general aviation pilot, and uh, was at that time also a United Airlines pilot, and he has since retired. But uh, anyway, everybody should have someone that they can look up to and seek information from. And uh, that is one thing I would, uh, I would probably change. I, would, I don't know how I'd go about re, uh, creating that or creating the structure for that, but I would certainly try to inspire people to look to um, make connections with somebody that they can, they can use to seek advice and wisdom. Well, that was not a set of questions, but interestingly enough, uh, Nappy, I can say this, uh, we're not ready to roll it out yet, but watch this space in the next couple of months. We're working oh. towards towards a, uh, we'll call it for now, laughingly a dating service to, to uh -huh. reach exactly what you're talking about. Yes, yes. Uh, to achieve sure. So, hey, by the way, by the way, Bob, I do hope you will ask me about the new uh, um, modification of the practical test standards to the uh, airman certification standards. Hey, Ryan, how, about the, uh, how about that modification? Oh, Bob, right I'm so it. glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked. There's nothing like you know, scripting the impromptu moment. So um, the, um, the, as for, for anybody that has followed this, the FAA is going to change the practical test standards. Change them. Um, now they will be called the Airman Certification Standards. The primary thing that is going to change, and this is to me a, a very big thing, and I am not a big fan of it, and I'll explain why is the uh, FAA is now going to include as, as part of the task for each maneuver, or for each task in this case, a, um, a risk assessment uh, section where the student will be responsible for answering, let's say, six or seven questions for each task area, and these questions will be risk assessment questions. So um, I, during the pre-flight section of the uh, airman certification standards, there may be six or seven questions dealing with uh, risk assessment in the pre-flight phase. And that same thing will apply to the steep turn phase, the straight level flight phase, navigation phase, and all the different uh, task areas of the um, PTS, now ACS. The problem with this is this. The, up until now, the practical test standards has, in my opinion, has been a, 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 as, as good a product as one could have to allow the practical flight test to be conducted in an objective manner. Well, as objective as it practically can. I, I think the practical test standards, the way they have evolved, are fantastic. I'm a, I'm a big fan because it makes it easy to see, you know, this is what I need to know. This is the minimum experience I need. These are the, this is the guideline for how to evaluate me on the flight test. Remember, it's called the practical test standards or testing standards, not the practical training standards. That's why we have a syllabus. Uh, the PTS guides you in terms of uh, knowing how to, uh, exactly how to know, so to speak, when your student is, is ready for the test. Well, it, it's one of the things that it tells you. The ACS now in my opinion, because of asking these uh, questions on risk assessment, is going to make the um, practical flight test far less objective and far more subjective. And case in point, um, we talk about risk assessment. Well, when NASA did risk assessment to find out why, uh, what the likelihood of a shuttle uh, failure was, in, uh, during the shuttle program, they concluded that they would lose about one shuttle in every 100 flights. So there's a 1% 1 1 chance of losing a shuttle um, uh, on, uh, over one, a, flight, a, a span of 100 flights. And that was a risk that they were willing to accept. That, that risk was assessed by statisticians, mathematicians, and NASA said, now that we know the risk mathematically, will we accept it? 
well, let's see, uh, yeah, we accept it. So that's, that's what NASA decided. You know, space is a risky business and 1% chance, a chance of losing a sh shuttle, 1% chance of losing the shuttle, one in 100, so to speak, is a risk they were willing to take. But when we talk about risk assessment, um, we don't use statisticians, uh, mathematicians, to make a mathematical evaluation, which is what the, the actual definition of risk is. And nor do we, do, has anybody given any of us guidance on whether that risk will be acceptable if we could define it. So the way risk assessment is practically done, it's, it's done based on ex mathematical statistical experience that pilots don't have and nobody knows the answer as to whether you would accept a 10% or 5% or a 1% chance of, let's say, a propeller blade a fracture in flight. Um, and I've written an article about this, and it is on my blog. It's called Ra Risk Assessment, Really, and it's on my blog at rodmachado.com. You can take a look at it. The point is that um, the way people practically uh, assess or risk is they get a feeling as to whether something is safe or not. And I, I really feel for the poor student who's going to come out for his flight check, and some designated examiner is going to ask him and say, what's the uh, risk associated with a, let's say, a, a BB-sized dent in a Hartzell H2CC YK1 propeller with that dent located one and one-half foot from the hub on the leading edge of that propeller to a depth of one-third the size of a BB. What is the risk associated with that? Or just pick a dent, any dent on a propeller. And first of all, there's no way of knowing that risk, and the poor student is just going to have to take a guess. Risk assessment is essentially guess assessment. And uh, as a result, this is just one reason why the new ACS, uh, in my opinion, is going to make the practical a flight test far less objective and far more subjective. That's, and by the way, says nothing about uh, how a lawyer who has a client that say that lost a, a family member in an airplane crash, how that lawyer is going to treat this, I don't know, because he's probably going to look at the uh, uh, ACS and see, oh my gosh, look, all these different things, this a student had to be responsible for, and that student, hmm, let's see, the student has to be able to answer a question on the, let's say, risk of landing. Can you identify the risks of landing? What are the risks associated with landing in a crosswind? And I, I don't know. It worries me to death to think about how a lawyer uh, could question a flight instructor on the stand and make that flight instructor uh, look very, very bad in front of a jury by asking that flight instructor him or her questions, such as, now you assume, I assume you prepared your student for um, the, uh, to understand and assess risk properly. And because the ACS says that um, that student had to understand the answers or had to provide answers to the question of risk assessment in this particular area. And uh, so, you know, why did this uh, student crash? And um, why are, you know, why, and, and, and thus, how do you explain your actions? Uh, and therefore, to me, Bob, this makes me extremely nervous. I think lawyers are going to have a field day with this. But, you know, I may be wrong here, but it's the liability concern is something that would really concern me. Okay, I, I hope you're wrong too, but that does raise a point. A good instructor, instead of somebody who's just pushing them through by rote, but a good instructor does work to teach uh, student judgment or risk assessment or pick your phrase or safety. Uh, I think they're all words that revolve around the same concepts. Yes, how do we, they do. How, how, do we, how do we teach a new flight instructor? I'll go that way. A new, I'm considered a mentor. I do a lot of talking to new instructors, but how do we teach them to teach safety or teach risk assessment or judgment? What yes. would you well, well, first of all, and again, the, uh, just because the, and, and I'll answer your question uh, in just a second, but just to make sure that uh, I get so excited talking about this, it's, uh, it's, it's so important. Um, just because the risk assessment questions now in the ACS, the new ACS, just because those questions weren't there 
uh, weren't delineated as they will be in the old PTS, that doesn't mean flight instructors didn't, te didn't teach hazard assessment, danger assessment, threat assessment, or where it could be practically done, risk assessment. That, uh, flight instructors always did that. That's just part of their job. Even when, if they didn't realize they were doing it, they did it, and I'll explain how in a second. So the new ACS just formalizes this, and thus in the act of formalizing it, um, uh, in my opinion, makes me a little more concerned about what liability I would have when I'm training a particular student. Uh, not, not to say the student's not gonna be trained properly, uh, but I am saying that from a, 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 looking at a, um, a trial lawyer or a tort lawyer's uh, perspective, uh, my gosh, we just give them far more fodder with which to uh, pursue the, uh, a, a liability judgment against a flight instructor, whereas the PTS has been reasonably vague that it's, it, 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 um, it, it doesn't make it easier, I think, for the law to come after a CFI. Uh, that's just my opinion. To answer your question, Bob, how do you teach judgment and risk assessment, well, threat assessment, hazard assessment, danger assessment? Um, Richard Bem at Stanford University in 1972 said something, I, I, it just stuck with me ever since I read it. It was a powerful statement. He said, our basic belief and values are instilled based on those whom we role model after. In other words, uh, our role models convey powerful behavioral dispositions um, and and that that uh, and that type of uh, behavioral change in the face of somebody that we respect that we admire um, is is behavioral change that is uh, directly in line with this idea of teaching risk assessment, judgment, threat assessment, aviation decision making. And I'll, I'll give you a real quick example of that. Um, when what the student sees the flight instructor do the student mimics. And flight instructors who comport themselves very well when they're training a student, um, they realize, I hope they realize, and many of them do, of course, that that student is watching them. And any type of, uh, let's say, aggressive behavior, assertive behavior, uh, unnecessary assertive behavior, um, recalcitrant behavior, anti-authority behavior, anything like that that the student observes, the student is gonna think, oh, that's the way that I should fly when I'm by myself. But a flight instructor who comports himself or herself differently in such a way that, you know, we don't want to do this, we don't want to act this way, we want to behave this way, respect for the rules, res respect for the machine, respect for uh, the system, those kind of things. That is the way that we influence the student's behavior and in a long-term let's say, values type of way. So when, um, as an example, when I get in an airplane, even if it's my, my Cessna 150 Landomatic, I, I get in that airplane, I still, I use, I use a checklist. It, it's part of my Bushido, my code of ethics. I do it. If I didn't do that, I would feel, I'd feel, I'd feel bad. So it's a matter of honor for me. I use checklists. I don't need a checklist to start a 150. You can just, just move your hand around and the thing will start. So, uh, but I do it because it's the right thing to do. And I know that someday somebody's gonna be watching me and I want them to know that, hey, this is the right way to do it. So that's how you teach basic belief and uh, that's how you teach decision-making and judgment in the airplane. Now, there are other ways to do that, but um, you could be pointing out things such as in an airplane, if you fly with me, Bob, I'm looking right, left, up, down, back and forth, not in a spastic way, but in a consistent and method. Uh, 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 um, in, in a consistent and uh, 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 focused way so that I'm trying to identify airplanes uh, that I know that are in my vicinity, and there are quite a few out here in Southern California, but the student sees me, and I'm also cueing the student to do the exact same thing. So student sees, student does. I think there was a wonderful poem many years ago that I, I don't recall who the author was, but it says, no written word nor moral plea can teach, teach young hearts what they should be, nor all the books upon the shelves, but what the teachers are themselves. So what the teacher does, the student mimics. That is the single most effective way of 
training, basic beliefs, values, aviation decision making, threat assessment, danger assessment in the airplane. In the airplane. On the ground, there are many other ways, but in the airplane, that's how you do it. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty powerful. Um, a lot of good comments are uh, coming in. Um, scrolling back up to, uh, to one, the question was, will this change in the PTS affect the sport pilot rule? And I'll be honest with you, I, I haven't kept up with this. We have Phil Pointer, our VP of uh, Governmental Affairs, who, uh, who watches this stuff for us. Um, and I haven't thought to ask him about it lately. So. Yeah, I don't. An across the board change, you know? Uh, n no, this. I think this is uh, primarily for the flooded, uh, for the private pilot license, the first one, uh, first ACS, the first PTS that will evolve to a to the ACS, uh, and then the. Uh, f let's see, I, I believe the uh, commercial instrument, inf or maybe it's the flight instructor that will take place next, the flight instructor PTS that will evolve to the PT to the ACS. Okay. And um, that, uh, that is what's uh, going to happen. And by the way, the other reason for the ACS, uh, and, and so to answer your question, excuse me, to answer your question, I don't think the uh, uh, sport pilot rule is, uh, uh, the sport pilot PTS is going to change um, soon. I may be wrong on that, but that's my understanding. The other thing about the ACS that probably, uh, the thing that really, uh, really bothers me, and by the way, a lot of good people have worked on the ACS, the working committee. Many of them are my friends. Uh, they're all good folks. I just happen to disagree with what, um, what the ACS, the, the concept, I, I don't think it's going to do what they say it's going to do. What they say it's going to do is reduce aviation accidents. I, I don't think that's going to have a reduction in aviation accidents myself, but I do think it's going to cause the uh, I'm sorry, it will cause flight training to cost a lot more. Uh, and the FAA put out a 10-page question and answer, uh, I should say, uh, 10 pages of answers uh, to try to convince people that the, uh, the, the new ACS is going to reduce the cost of flight training. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, I think that's pure sophism. I just don't think that that's actually going to happen. Okay. You know, I hope I'm wrong. I really, I, yeah. I absolutely hope I'm wrong, but you yeah, know, you got to, you got to go with common sense here. Um, yeah. Adding increase in the PTS by 30% to the ACS now by adding the risk assessment questions is not going to reduce the cost of flight training. It's going to increase, if anything, it's got to increase the uh, the time spent on the check ride, and uh, the flight instructor is going to have to uh, spend more time dealing specifically with teaching his students to respond to um, these um, risk assessment questions. And there's not going to be, there's no objective answer for many of these risk assessment questions because it's risk, which we are, which is, as I explained, uh, not something that is um, uh, easily, easily objectified. You know, it's funny, 20 years of flying, you think, and uh, dealing with the regulations. Uh, question came up today with another flight instructor, and something as objective as the FAR. So you think, yeah, this is easy. Nah, huge argument. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm, uh, a indeed. great question came from Tammy, and she says, slightly off topic, but it's a compliment, and it's uh, one I'm going to echo. Uh, she's reading a lot of your books, uh, mm -hmm. and she would love to know if it's possible to get some sort of ground instruction from you. Now, I've been trying to get the California and, and just get in an airplane with you sometime, and it hasn't worked out in, in all this time. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave this one up to you. Yeah, Bob, I still flight instruct. I don't do, um, right now I'm not doing primary students or instrument students. I'm not doing students. What I'm doing is um, at um, if, if somebody calls up and they want to fly and it fits into my schedule, I'll go out and do typically two things. One, proficiency flights. Uh, and the other one would be biennial flight reviews. Those two things I can do because they don't take a great deal of time. So uh, I, you know, I'm still a flight, active flight instructor. But when I, I guess when my typing fingers wear out, I'll go back to full-time flight instructor. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, yeah. so, uh, yeah. No, it, it, you can always write and ask. And if I'm free, uh, I'm I'm happy to go out and fly. It's it's or or do ground instruction, whatever. And by the way, just uh, as an observation, um, because. I, I get this question a lot. Uh, I write all my own books. I do all my own um, graphics. I do everything. The only thing I don't do is print them on a Heidelberg because I can't get that press into my garage. 
<laughs> if I could get it, if I could get it in my garage uh, and read German, I would I would print my own books. But I I can't do that. So I do everything. So they all come from from me from my experience, uh, and they're essentially written by a flight instructor, and they're not written by a corporation, a a, a large group of people. They're written by one guy, and uh, with with uh, a certain amount of experience. And uh, that's reflected also in my latest book, the How to Fly uh, Ramachandra's How to Fly an Airplane uh, Handbook. And that book I wrote not only for the student, but also for the flight instructor. It will make the flight instructor's job a whole lot easier because you, uh, I wrote it so that it covers all the basic fundamentals of flying, um, straight level flight, climbs, turns, descents, and so on. And it shows the student how to do this in a very general way, so it applies to, to, to all airplanes. And uh, then I give a lot of reasons why certain things are done one way and, and done another. And um, so it'll make the flight instructor's job a lot easier. It'll also make it easier for anybody working on a flight instructor rating in terms of helping prepare their lesson plans. And uh, that, you know, might be a good thing. It's, that's the book I've been – how many years was I yelling at you to, to write a book for flight instructors? And um, every time I, saw, I don't know. Every time I saw you at Oshkosh, I think I, I bugged you. In, um, so, Tammy, uh, Tammy did follow up, and I'll, I'll pass this on. She would love, to, and I'm not going to push you for an answer on this one. Uh, this is just a vote from the, from the folks in the field. They'd love to have an opportunity to get some remote training from you sometime. So something, something else you can put on your list uh, to do list someday. Oh, indeed. Hey, by the way, Bob, I also have uh, something I started a, um, about two months ago, a flight instructor affiliate program. And uh, that is, you can go right to my website and click on the top. Uh, my website's rodmachado.com, R-O-D-M-A-C-H-A-D-O. And um, anybody who signs up as an affiliate um, and uh, uh, if they signs up as an affiliate, then I will give you 15% of anything, uh, any sales that you refer via a, an affiliate web link that you can uh, give to your students or put on your own website. And, uh, you know, that's like one book, one physical book is, uh, um, I think, nets a, a flight instructor $10. Uh, so, or one uh, um, audio book would net a flight instructor $15. So those kind of things uh, help out uh, in terms of helping the flight instructor make money. And any flight instructor who's teaching ground school, we also have our products available as a, uh, 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 for wholesale, too. So they could buy our books wholesale and then uh, sell them to the students um, at uh, at retail, and uh, you know, make I think it's uh, 40 to 50 percent uh, available on on that exchange. So that's possible too. And you can just go to the website and request information from there. Um, and that answers one of the questions uh, uh, that somebody asked. Uh, Jeff Gerber asks. Uh, well, you know, I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask Jeff to contact you on the, this last question. It's, uh, he's, he's trying to figure out how to get a flight school to, uh, or a, a, a local uh, pilot supply store to stock your books. So I'll let, I'll let you deal with that. Sure, uh, okay. I'll contact you directly on that. So any, uh, we're coming up on the top of the hour. We, uh, we, can, uh, we take an hour uh, once a month for this. Um, any closing thoughts? Well, um, I... I probably have a lot of closing thoughts. <laughs> I get to talk about flight instruction. This is, this is such a, an exciting thing for me. You know, I, I, uh, I don't know if there's, to me, it's just such a noble profession. Uh, and um, just as, as a, a quick observation, many years ago, I started out flight instructing, and uh, I have an educational background in psychology, so I decided that um, in the 19, early 1980s that maybe I was spending too much time in aviation and not enough time um, in, in, let's say, and I, I'll say this in quotes, the real world. And so um, I was out doing a lot of talking in the mid to late 1980s, talking to bankers, lawyers, doctors, pharmacists, construction workers, and I'm thinking, you know, I know I'm missing something because I'm, I'm just dealing with pilots and airplanes. And I had this epiphany uh, when I was in Boston, Massachusetts in 1987, and I was talking to 1,000 bankers. And I'm looking at the audience, and bankers are, you know, are neat folks to talk to, but I'm looking at the audience, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. I, it just hit me. Everything I needed to learn about life, everything I needed to learn about uh, me, anything I needed to learn about anything, I could learn 
by just being involved in airplanes. And by way of another example, uh, the Japanese have a, the, their tea ceremony that leads to insight and light enlightenment, um, martial arts that leads to insight and enlightenment. They have the art of flower arra arrangement that leads to insight and enlightenment. And you know what? Uh, I went back to uh, just talking to pilots and uh, teaching people how to fly and uh, dealing with writing aviation books. And uh, I'm so happy I did because um, it, everything I needed to learn about life, I could learn by dealing with people who fly airplanes, students and airplanes and the aviation community. And it's been the ultimate education. So as I would say to anybody who's in the flight instructor business, um, yes, your students are learning a great deal, but you are learning more about um, yourself. You're learning more about the world, uh, other people than you possibly ever imagined. And not, <laughs> I'm, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here to everyone listening, but the fact is they know how much they learn from their students and the airplane environment. Um, but I'm constantly amazed at how I underestimate how much I learn from this experience. It's, it's truly been an amazing experience for me. And I hope anybody else who f trains people to fly uh, uh, it recognizes how important it is for them and also for their students too. Well, I'll echo what Bill David said on the chat room. Very well said. Rod, I'm looking up uh, above my computer and I got a whole bunch of books about, and about 15 pounds of them paper printed by, written and printed by you. So I want to thank you for helping contribute to, the, to my library. And uh, well, you, you bet, Bob. And you, you do realize yeah. I, I help you contribute to your rate of climb too, because if you have those books in the airplane with you, and you couldn't clear that tree at the end of the runway, you just toss them out, my friend. And <laughs> you get an extra 500 feet per minute rate because they are pretty there good you go. books. <laughs> there you go. Well, they're I also available you, in ebooks too, by the way. So that's that's true. I got to tell you, they're all great. My personal favorite is still um, well, chapter 11 of the Instrument Flying Handbook will, is still my favorite because it, it finally explains how, how a plate is built. I love the private pilot, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Rod and Shadow's plane talk, uh, particularly uh, the one story you tell about your friend. Uh, I'll let people discover that one themselves. Um, we use that, believe it or not, in my other business as a safety talk. Oh, well, thank you, Bob. Thank you. So that, that's we, very kind. I, I, stole, I stole that out right So uh, I'm going to ask... You did. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, here, is, is there a chance we can get you back sometime? Cause this oh, of course, Bob. Anytime. Just ask. I, uh, I'm happy to. I'm a big supporter of NAFI and anything I can do to help uh, my fellow flight instructor. Uh, heavens knows I've been helped by so many flight instructors in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I just enjoy, uh, I enjoy the process. I enjoy aviation. And anything I do, you ask, and uh, I'm happy to do it. I appreciate that. This has been one of the fastest hours we've had. Um, at, at this point, I'm supposed to announce who we'll have next month, but I haven't gotten a confirmation yet from that individual, so I'm going to ask everybody to watch eMentor. I should be able to put it out there next week. Rod, again, I want to say thank you very, very much for your, your time and everything you do, and uh, it's always a pleasure seeing you in person, and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. And in the meantime, uh, stay in touch. I, I certainly Sorry, step down. I, I, I will do that, Bob. Thank you. And I'm looking at the list of the people who are attending here, and some, many of them I actually know. And so to all those folks, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for attending tonight. I sure do appreciate I'm thinking, why would all, everybody be attending the, uh, the, the seminar or the program tonight? And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, these folks can't dance. <laughs> no, I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well said. All right, Rod. Be safe out there in California. Everybody else, fly a lot. Be safe. Teach your students well. And uh, be, as I said, I used to say on, uh, on uh, my, uh, Hill Street Blues, be careful out there. Thanks much.